Welcome everyone to the first of the department seminar series sessions. Um, this seminar series happens every other Tuesday in Michaelmas and Lent terms between 12.30 to 2. Thanks to Joe, um, we're keeping it on Zoom and it worked quite well last year, so hopefully it will work just as well this year. Uh, today we're okay, super- Okay, that looks like everyone's joined now, Ali, if you want to kick things off. Cool. You're gonna need to uh, mute welcome, your everyone. YouTube, Ali, mute yeah. your YouTube tab. Not your Zoom mic, your YouTube tab, that's it. Sorry, everyone, I was on YouTube at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, I think the last thing I said was hopefully it'll be just as good this year as last year. That did not happen last year, so I've already made it worse than last year. But we're gonna be redeemed by our speaker today, um, uh, Dr. Jana Basevic, who is coming back to Cambridge where you did your PhD. Um, where she now works as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Durham University. Uh, Jana is a social theorist with an interest in aspects of knowledge, ranging from formal epistemology to social practices, politics and policies. Their work combines philosophy, sociology and political economy to study how ideas, institutions and practices of knowledge production interact with the social world. Her recent publications address questions such as the role of expert knowledge and critique, access and social justice in higher education, um, and the politics and policies of valuing, measuring, and distributing knowledge. She's particularly interested in the relationships between knowledge, power, forms of community, identity, and justice. So um, we're already excited to have you back, Jana, and we're already looking forward to this uh, to this presentation. It's going to be for around forty five minutes. Then we'll move on to a forty five minutes uh, Q and A. If you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand on Zoom. You can type the question into the chat function on Zoom, or if you're participating via YouTube, just use the YouTube chat, and I will um, be looking at that at the same time. But I will not be putting the video on for the reasons uh, that just transpired. So Jana, uh, let's go through to your presentation then. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Joe, and thank you, thank you to the department for inviting me. I am really happy to be here, even though it is only virtually in part because, as Ali has said, um, I did my PhD, my second PhD at the Department of Sociology in Cambridge, in part because what I will be talking about today addresses uh, an analytical framework I interacted with at length during my PhD, and in part because a lot of it also addresses conversations and discussions I've had with people, uh, especially fellow doctoral students and postdocs, uh, while I was at Cambridge. So in some ways, this talk and the content of this talk in particular is very much Cambridge-infused. Now, I mentioned to Ali as we we're chatting before the start of this uh, talk that uh, thinking about how connected to Cambridge the content of this, uh, of this contribution is, I looked through my computer and attempted to find um, any kind of photograph or memento of my time at Cambridge. I graduated in 2019 um, and left in 2020. Uh, so I expected something iconic like uh, myself in the Department of Sociology, the, the new one or the old building or in front of the infamous red door, which is where uh, doctoral students would have normally gone to submit their, uh, their PhD dissertations before the pandemic and before uh, the redevelopment. But what I found instead is this photo from the UCU rally against the gender pay gap in 2019, which I mean, in some ways is iconic because you can see the famous King's College outline behind it, but also in some ways connects to precisely what I will be talking about today. So 
I hope you've taken some time to read these. Do any of these statements sound or seem familiar to you? Today, the thing I will be talking about is how are these statements related? What do they have to do with the proportion of women, minority and uh, other staff that struggle to stay in the academia? And among other things, what does this mean for decolonizing the curriculum? Now, I will be now rehashing some of the things that I think are quite familiar to you, but just in case. Uh, the terrain of inequalities in academia has been shifting for a long time. Many initiatives obviously address uh, widening participation and access to institutions of higher education globally. Women, for instance, have been the majority of undergraduate and master level students across UNESCO countries since 1990. In the EU, women make up 58% of bachelor and master level graduates and almost a half of PhDs in all fields. But to this day, there are only 24% professors in the European Union who are women. Now, obviously one of the reasons why we're talking about gender is because it is one of the things that are easier to measure longitudinally as well as cross-culturally or cross-contextually. So now when we shift to the UK, what does it look like? In the UK academic workforce, women comprise about half non-professorial academic staff, but less than 20% professorial academic staff. When we shift onto the, the terrain of minority ethnic academics, I am sure many of you will have heard this before, uh, they occupy 13% of non-professorial academic posts, but altogether less than 8% of professorial. In other words, if we shift that around, uh, among professors in the United Kingdom, the overwhelming majority are white, uh, and then a smaller, very small proportion are respectively Asian, Chinese, and mixed, with uh, Black professors making up only 0.6% of the entire professoriate. How does this happen? Um, there have been for a long time attempts to, to explain why is it that women leave academia disproportionately to their participation rate at lower levels of education. The phenomenon has been dubbed the leaky pipeline precisely to reflect the fact that it is not entirely clear where do women disappear. Um, there have been different uh, ways of accounting for how this happens. One explanation is the so-called motherhood penalty, which is that obviously uh, women are more likely to take uh, parental or uh, maternity leave during periods of childbirth, and that this impacts not only their productivity, but also how they are judged by their colleagues and peers. Namely, one of the things that motherhood penalty research shows is that women who are new mothers are judged as less competent uh, by their colleagues, regardless of the rate of output, so regardless of how much they actually produce or publish. Uh, but if they continue to produce at comparable rates prior uh, to becoming parents, uh, then they're judged as more aggressive or more competitive. These gender standards of behavior are particularly vicious towards uh, women who are minority or women of color who do not only have to conform or somehow deal with gendered standards of behavior when it comes to competitiveness but are also expected or as research shows are expected to perform more care labor including towards uh, other minority students. When it comes to publications, um, articles that have been written by authors whose names can be identified as women's names, and obviously there are some limits to how this is measured, and I'm very happy to talk about uh, methodologies later on. Uh, but in essence, these articles spend longer in peer review. Uh, they are evaluated more harshly by reviewers, regardless for that matter of their clarity or structure. And they are, or at least research done sort of in the mid of last, around the middle of the last decade showed that they were cited less often, especially when women were single first or last authors. 
We do not have comparable data for BME academics for several reasons, some of which I think should be methodologically obvious, but it would be really interesting to look at whether there is something similar or perhaps something related but more complex, and I will be talking about that shortly. Teaching evaluations, sadly, are biased against women and then again, especially against women of color. In fact, an experiment um, conducted in 2016 that aimed to measure how students respond to instructors if they are given the same content by to but told that instructors are of different gender uh, showed that students, tend, students of all genders for that matter tend to rate uh, women's teaching or teaching they were told was performed by women systematically lower than that performed by instructors they were told are men. So just thinking that the instructor uh, is a woman was sufficient to drive down ratings. And then last but not least, women are less likely to win research, competitive research grants, though not in all fields. And this is something that has uh, started to shift, but I think it speaks uh, to something that we'll be discussing at the very end of this talk, which is um, the politics and political economy of knowledge production. Well, at least it's a wonderful time to be a minority academic, isn't it? Not exactly. Not only are minority academics exposed to what has been described as systematic racism in higher education institutions, but they also have to navigate a whole set of regular microaggressions or what has been the everyday racism and are treated as what Myanmar Pua has described as bodies out of place. So as if they somehow do not belong. On your left hand side, you can see UCU data that um, analyzes the proportion of minority versus white um, applicants to academic positions. The upper hand uh, one is professorial, the lower hand one is senior lecturer positions. And there you can see that the success rate uh, of white versus BME staff is significantly skewed in favor of white staff. Now, the interesting thing to observe there is that it's not exactly or not always the shortlisting stage at which this occurs, but rather the appointment stage. So somehow minority academics are getting shortlisted more often, I guess, as opposed to not at all, but uh, they are not getting promote, uh, promote, appointed, nor for that matter promoted, and that's uh, what you can see on your right hand side at the same rate as their white peers. Now, the study or the figure on the right hand side is from Nicola Brolux's um, analysis of the career progression of Black female professors in UK academia. And it shows this convoluted pipeline, or perhaps several pipelines. I think it's really interesting to, to connect this to the concept of uh, the leaky pipeline uh, that depicts how women who are uh, trying to get promoted and happen to be black in the UK academia get or do not get to navigate the system. So it becomes uh, ever so more complex. So it's not exactly a good time to be a minority academic if there ever was one. Obviously, yes, it is very much intersectional. Um, Advanced AG's most recent data offers, I think, a very good graph that shows uh, the odds of staying in academia between uh, for students or the difference of odds in staying in the academia for a student who is white and male versus a student who is BAME and female. So I'm just going to leave that there for a second. As we, we can see, proportionately, it becomes less likely. And then going back to the photograph from the start, it's not only that um, chances of staying in the academia impact job security and other things, they also impact the amount of pay uh, that academics are expected to get. Now, it is common knowledge that uh, women are underrepresented and certainly BAME women are underrepresented in the top tiers of the academic profession, both in terms of seniority 
and in terms of pay. Um, the table on your right hand side also shows, I think, quite graphically, as tables are meant to do, the distance in earning relative to Y2K men for all staff. So basically, everyone earns less than white UK men, but obviously how much uh, or how much less that is uh, varies or has a clear correlation with both gender and ethnicity. And worryingly, obviously, some of these things, or at least uh, some people tend to ascribe these things to historical effects or generational differences. Of course, participation of women and in particular participation of minority women in the academia has been historically low and we're only seeing that significantly increase over the past three to four decades, which should already be enough to show some significant effects. But many people would say, well, I think we can safely say that inequality is on the way out. Not really. As the graph on the lower right hand side shows, differences in income between men and women are obviously highest or most pronounced um, in professor pay grades, but they exist in favor of men in early career lecture pay grades as well. And it would be quite interesting to find out why. Let's see if we can find out why. Let's see if we can do something about that. What my research focuses on is the role of informal judgments in academic careers and career progression. Now, widening participation and EDI initiatives, as I'm sure many of you do not need to be told, are focused on the removal of formal obstacles to participation in higher, edu in higher education institutions. Um, initiatives like Athena Swan or the Race Equality Charter offer further incentives for equalizing or removing bias from formal processes of promotion and recognition. However, success in the academia, just like success anywhere else, rests on a series of different interconnected judgments. Sociology in particular has been quite instrumental in demonstrating how these judgments tend to reflect the gendered, classed, raced, and other kinds of assumptions that people have in terms of different groups and that they're not always conscious. Now, obviously formal selection and evaluation processes aim to correct for these biases through different instruments, uh, from supported progression and um, access initiatives to obviously training uh, members of say selection committees to control or to watch out for each other's implicit biases and so on and so forth. But what about informal judgments? What about relational judgments of worth? Knowledge is, or academia, is in essence about, or I think we at least like to think so, it is in essence about valuing other people's knowledge. Now, when we talk about valuing, or when we talk about the relationship between evaluation and evaluation, I'm using here a relatively broad definition that is a composite of several other definitions I'm also very happy to get um, into more detail in terms of what this means and how it works. But in essence, it consists of the assignment of worth or value in relation to specific criteria, which is usually what happens in evaluation. So whereas when we evaluate, we basically just say, well, I think we, we assign worth. When it comes to evaluation, we tend to say what we assign worth in relation to. So we try to make it somehow comparable. What are informal and relational judgments of worth? They are things that happen at conferences. They are things that happen in the infamous corridor talk. Obviously with um, the pandemic and social distancing and Zoom corridor talk has somewhat been replaced by other formats. And it, I mean, one of the things that I am currently working on is thinking about what modes of relating have replaced uh, so-called corridor talk, although obviously 
uh, some corridor talk I'm assuming has resumed across higher education institutions um, that all build up towards things that we know as reputation, but then also referencing, and I don't mean only bibliographies, I mean what we see as a relevant reference or point of reference for a certain body of knowledge, but then also other things, invitations to, uh, I was going to say invitations to invite to talks, invitations to give talks, like this one, um, citations, increasingly old metrics, and so on and so forth. So how do these judgments play a role in who gets to stay and who doesn't get to stay in the academia and furthermore, what happens to those who do? The concept of epistemic injustice was um, formalized by Miranda Fricker, but also building on a lot of other and previous work by feminists and in particular women of color and then developed to um, stipulate that there are situations and in societies we tend to think or like to think are equal or liberal these situations are still plenty where certain speakers are disadvantaged in their capacity as knowers because of who they are. So because of the social identity they are seen as inhabiting. The concept of intellectual positioning or positioning more broadly consists of the idea that in any kind of interaction, any kind of social interaction, including scholarship, we both assume and assign a position to others that is associated with a set of characteristics, capabilities, or attributes in some contexts, more formally rights and obligations. So we tend to position ourselves in relation to other people, but we also tend to position other people when we designate other people as something in conversation, in writing, uh, in referencing, in tweeting. This is a form of positioning. We can position ourselves towards different intellectual schools. For instance, we can say that we are a Marxist, or we can say that we are a critical theorist, or we can say something else. Uh, and we can also obviously position ourselves in relation to different political and ideological projects. We can call ourselves feminists, we can call ourselves anti-racist, we can call ourselves uh, different kinds of things. Obviously, we can also do things that mix both, but this is not the essence or this isn't the gist of my talk today. What I'm talking about today is the concept of epistemic positioning, which is something I've developed to depict the context in which knowledge claims are interpreted, and that's a rather broad term, in relation to speakers assumed or asserted or stated social identity. What does this mean? This means that epistemic positioning essentially links something that I've referred to elsewhere as the relationship between epistemic subjects and epistemic objects. Who knows and what is there to be known? We can talk about um, these two terms uh, separately or together and what they mean and how they are related to different modes of knowledge. But in the context of this particular talk, and in the context of the question, who gets to stay in the academia and how are they treated once they do, what I'm most interested in is the intersection between epistemic positioning and valuation. So how is the value of knowledge objects, the knowledge we produce, our articles, um, our essays, our books, anything else, connected to how certain people are valued in academic contexts. What I will be introducing is a fourfold typology of epistemic positioning, which isn't to say that this is the only kind of epistemic positioning that happens, uh, nor for that matter that it is exhaustive, but I think that these four types of positioning are quite central to understanding why is it that some people just happen to leak out of the pipeline. The first one is bounding, which consists of designating knowledge claims as a reflection of personal or political concerns. The, uh, the second one is domaining, which means that, that we designate someone's knowledge claim as constrained 
to a specific field or topic and not unrelated to the social identity of knowers. Non-attribution is a form of positioning in which we use others' knowledge claims, but we don't attribute that authorship to them. So in some way, it's positioning without naming. And then appropriation is a form of positioning in which we actually take someone else's uh, knowledge claim and present it or accept it being presented as our own. The thing we regularly and conventionally call plagiarism, but as I will be arguing and hopefully demonstrating here, many other things that border uh, on plagiarism are uh, this kind of positioning and many are never addressed or recognized as such. Now, what is bounding? Some of you may be familiar with this um, as it's called, uh, grievance studies controversy. So um, a couple of years ago, a group of academics, uh, Lindsay um, Pluckrose and Bogosian have published something which was or announced, revealed something that was supposed to be an analogy of uh, the so-called hoax in physics, um, where they um, conducted a something they would have referred to as an experiment. Uh, they've submitted to a number of journals in feminist, LBGT, uh, critical theory uh, studies. Um, they've submitted articles they claimed were reliant, well, first of all, were completely fabricated and were reliant on what they described as shoddy methodologies in order to prove that um, those fields and journals in those fields, academic journals in those fields, had basically no standards of scholarship. What was the gist of their claim? And obviously, some of the some of the claims that they have been made that they have made have been disproved in the sense of it became obvious that of the articles they had submitted, only a small fraction passed even the first stage of peer review, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I'm not going to get um, into too much detail about that. Now, the essence of their, their claim was that these fields, and people who work in these fields are focused less on finding truth and more on attending to social grievances. And that this makes these fields and knowledge claims within these fields essentially not scientific. Um, right hand side, you can see both are um, excerpts from uh, the article in which they revealed uh, their experiment, you can see how they come to designate different fields as what they call grievance studies. So it is the identification uh, of um, aspects of culture in minute detail in order to attempt, as they say, diagnosis of power imbalances rooted in, in identity, as I'm sure won't come as a great surprise to many of you. Um, a lot of social sciences and humanities would in principle qualify and fall uh, under this designation. But they're not the only ones who expose certain fields to this kind of treatment. Um, in uh, Living a Feminist Life, Sarah Ahmed describes a very similar experience of submitting an essay and being told that the essay is not theory, it seems not even feminist or what Black Rose Lindsay and Bogosian would have called a uh, grievance that is theory, but it's politics. And that it's not theory because theory is not supposed to be about women. So as an implication, Ahmed's essay is about women. Uh, women or gender are not about theory. Women or gender are about politics. And politics, as we know, is also not theory. Now, bounding can be related to an older concept in uh, sociology of science and sociology of knowledge, which is boundary keeping. Now, traditionally, boundary keeping in science served to exclude non-scientific discourses, things like astrology and um, conspiracy theories and homeopathy and so on and so forth. But in this particular case, it is not the case of excluding certain kinds of knowledge and knowledge claims from academic knowledge production in total 
it is more about devaluing them as they continue to participate. Some of you will probably recognize reverberations of different kinds of critique of um, male-centric or male-dominated um, discourses that have traditionally designated, for instance, women's speech as being too subjective or overtly emotional, meaning overtly too emotional for academic contexts, and the critique that objectivity itself is gendered. So that objectivity notion, the ideal of objectivity rests uh, on the Cartesian distinction between mind and matter and that certain kinds of bodies and certain kinds of people, and let's be honest, bodies overall, are primarily associated with matter, whereas intellectual uh, matters, to pardon the pun, should reside in the mind. But that is not all. Um, one does not even need to subscribe to this kind of distinction to be exposed to, say, the designations of women's and gender studies as musings of sexually frustrated women, as Maria de Mars Perrier's uh, study of the attempts to institutionalize gender uh, and women's studies in Portugal shows. So the question is not whether someone is positioned out of the field of knowledge production as not scientific at all, and in that sense, Black Rose, Lindsay and Bogosian are somewhat of an exception or perhaps an extreme end, but Trotter is not sufficiently scientific. And the idea is that if knowledge draws on elements of experience or elements of identity, then it can't be anything else. That is all that is. It is rooted as uh, let's say Black Rose, Black Rose and Bogosian say, it is rooted in identity. It is rooted in a sense, meaning experience, meaning emotion of oppression, but it is not in any sort of way objective. So it's not translatable. It cannot speak to anyone who doesn't share that kind of position. A famous example of this are Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre for that matter. So for instance, um, the Beauvoir philosophy was often described and um, during a certain period of time certainly attacked as focusing on the experience that was a nice way of framing it or frustration, a less nice way of framing it, of women, whereas Sartre's philosophy was framed as focusing on existence. Now, obviously, existence as an epistemic object is a rather broader class than the experience of women, despite the fact that they were writing about the same things. In fact, the Beauvoir uh, incursion into philosophy in the writing of the second sex came primarily from the understanding that Sartre's philosophy did not account for the existence of about half or slightly bit more than half of humanity. Yet, one of them will regularly continue to be uh, identified as feminist philosophy and taught uh, and analyzed mostly, if not exclusively, uh, in contexts where or in women and gender studies, and the other will continue to be taught as philosophy or philosophy proper. What about domaining? Um, domaining consists of being associated with a certain kind field on the basis of one's identity. Um, I've used this article from uh, The Guardian. I said that this talk will be quite Cambridge infused. So this is uh, one of mine and Ali's, and as a matter of fact, uh, former PhD um, colleagues, Jennifer Chisholm, uh, writing in The Guardian in 2018 about her experiences as a Black academic. And I'm going to give you a minute to, to read what Jennifer is saying. So the way that I understand what Jennifer is saying is not that maybe it's, it's, it's not that she wouldn't necessarily have wanted to focus on race, but her identity as a minority academic 
meant that she was constantly put in a position in which she was expected to. And Sarah Ahmed also writes about this uh, form of diversity work in which people who are seen as diverse are also seen as embodying diversity. So having to represent diversity in essentially not very diverse institutions. If you think that this is something that only happens to uh, PhD students or people at the time when they're doing their PhD, here is a very recent example, which is uh, Cornel West's resignation letter from Harvard Divinity School in June this year. Now, Cornel West is probably one of the most famous um, critical theorists, philosophers alive. And what happened to West was something very, very similar to what Chisholm is describing. So Cornel West, despite being a philosopher, much like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre, um, ended up in a context in which at the Harvard Divinity School, as he says in his resignation letter, all of his courses were subsumed under Afro-American religious studies. Despite the fact that, as you can see, or as we, as we can infer from the titles, West taught on rather broad topics, including, interestingly, existentialism, American democracy, and the conduct of life. To be honest, I have no clue what the conduct of life is as a um, as a form of teaching, but um, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. Now, another related, and this is an excerpt or a longer excerpt from one of the things I have showed at the beginning um, is Shahira Abdul Rahman's um, post from a couple of years ago at the Sociological Review website, where she describes her experiences of a case in Malaysia uh, that she thought would speak directly to um, the theory of reproduction of financialized elites. Um, and then also mention something that is a common observation in comparative studies of knowledge production, which is that people who work on parts of the world that are not the UK, the US, and um, to some degree Europe, although not all parts of Europe, um, and Australia and New Zealand, usually have to have a place designation, so a regional designation in the title of their knowledge contributions. And these knowledge contributions are positioned and evaluated accordingly. Again, there are different ways in which we can probably try to explain this. In some ways, affiliation or identification with specific disciplines is an outcome of the structural differentiation of the field of knowledge production, the so-called chaos of disciplines that um, Abbott describes. Um, in some ways, it is also an outcome of competition between different fields or trying to orient oneself within the field as an outcome of a career trajectory. So for instance, it can be an outcome of carving out a niche, especially for minority students and academics. It could also have to do with um, being or seeing predecessors or gatekeepers as models of access. So minority students, as well as women students, traditionally often entered the academic profession through someone they could see as a model. And in case that person would have been affiliated with a particular subfield, say uh, feminist theory or uh, say sociology of race, they would often end up working in the same subfield. Obviously, there are also ways or there are paradigms that interpret this particular kind of domaining as in and of itself a chosen one. Most notably standpoint epistemology and some for forms of intersectionality actually state that one's position within the social context does in fact afford um, epistemic privilege. So in that sense, we should not be, we should not avoid uh, that kind of uh, orientation, we should not claim that it, it, it is in some way a limitation rather than an advantage. But I think here it is very, very important to draw the distinction between positioning, so positioning oneself, being able to assert one's identity as uh, affiliated with a certain domain, 
versus being positioned as having one's contribution um, interpreted as being associated with a particular domain of knowledge. And the relationship between positioning and being positioned as, although clearly uh, not always as simple as that, also depends and on and reflects existing inequalities within the field of knowledge production. The more power we have, the more likely we are in a position to position other people, uh, as well as to choose our own positioning. The less power we have, the more we have to accept existing forms of positioning and or accept that we will be repeatedly positioned. What about norm attribution? We're getting towards the end. In 2019, a woman historian from the University of Virginia was listening to a show on US's public radio, the NPR. And as she said, uh, she got to the end of the segment, her quote is one of the quotes at the beginning of this talk, and did not hear what happened. Two historians who were actually hosting the podcast relied on her book, Cigarette, which was published, which is a history of the American tobacco industry and was published in 2019, to prepare their segment on the show. But because uh, the preparation or because the material that they used was prepared by the producers, the producers did not really think about crediting Sarah Milov for the book or the content of the book. Sarah Milov was at that point, um, she was filing her, well, she was about to submit her request for tenure and promotion. Uh, she had also recently at that point become a mother, which is relevant because it connects to the idea of there being a motherhood penalty. The two male historians who used her book without crediting her or her work were both white and tenured at that point. Obviously, it is easy to write this off as just a mission, but in some ways, we need to think about what is it that allows these kinds of omissions to per perpetuate themselves or to continue. In that sense, one of the good things that um, some more recent research shows is that Citation gender differences between citations seem to be decreasing or are becoming statistically insignificant. But as always, we need to make sure that how we use or what we think citations or metrics reflect or reveal is somewhat controlled. So we need to think about what do citations or metrics actually translate to. In Milo's case, the problem was not that her book would not be cited or credited as such. As, uh, as much as the fact that, say, appearance on public radio is very much connected to the so-called third mission of universities um, that is in the UK usually called citizenship and in the US usually called service. But also, and this kind of thing contributes to what I'm referring here as the, to here as the second order academic capital. Things we tend to think about as reputation or visibility or prestige have at the same time, meaning in terms of intellectual self-concepts, relations with others and so on, confidence and so on and so forth, but also have pretty much direct and also quantifiable consequences for stability in academic careers. What does this mean? If we take into account that men are more likely to cite other men and also more likely to self-cite, and if we take into account that women are subject to a double standard of behavioral evaluation, in which case, if they, if they too, well, if, if they promote their own work or if they are seen as promoting their own work too much, they're also being interpreted as pushy. So what does this mean for how we recognize contributions to knowledge as a whole? And what does this mean for how we credit 
knowers, how we recognize knowers as possessing a certain kind of knowledge. In other words, if we take all of this into account, why is my curriculum still white and male? I like the thing that my curriculum is not very much white and male, but moving on, you see what I mean. This brings us to the last kind of epistemic positioning, and that's appropriation. A traditional form of appropriation looks a bit like this, but luckily we don't have that kind of thing in the academic profession anymore. Or do we? Obviously, um, there are strict controls now on explicit plagiarism. In case any of you have ever submitted an academic essay that was supposed to be marked, your dissertations, thesis, anything else, you would have probably encountered the academic system Turnitin, which checks for plagiarism. So checks for explicit uh, representation of one's work um, as or someone else's work as one's own or often also checks for the explicit representations of one's uh, work as one's own uh, in the case of self plagiarism. But explicit plagiarism is probably not the majority of cases of appropriation. There is also what I'm calling here implicit plagiarism, which is borrowing from or using or reproducing someone else's work without crediting them. Now, there are different ways we can credit other people. One is obviously citations. When we're writing an academic article, we either include a snippet of the original text uh, in our own, or we mention it in, or at least we mention it in parentheses and then um, in bibliographies, we can elaborate on it in footnotes. We can acknowledge others in acknowledgements uh, which are common uh, in books and increasingly common at the end of academic articles and so on and so forth. And in some cases, that's absolutely fine. And also in some cases, we probably shouldn't be that sensitive about these things after all. Because I mean, as Robert Merton has said, there is something in science that we call obliteration by incorporation. So the more our knowledge becomes commonplace, the less likely it is that we will be or that anyone who actually invented it will be remembered. So we tend to, knowledge tends to get subsumed under the general body of knowledge um, and just becomes common sense, just becomes common knowledge. You would have heard several times in this talk that I said things such as, well, this is probably common knowledge, or I probably do not need to repeat this. And you will have probably encountered some names that are already quite familiar and that perhaps we can expect in um, 20, 50, 200 years time, who knows, will no longer be remembered, not because they've been forgotten, but because their contributions would have become part of this general universal pool of knowledge. Or maybe not. Another term that uh, is attributed to Robert Merton is the so-called Matthew effect, which is the tendency for scientific credit or recognition to accrue to those who already have masses of it, most likely senior academic man. Um, the Matthew effect itself relies on uh, the parable of Matthew or the parable of the talents, which states in the Bible, which states that those who do not, um, or to those who already have more shall be given, but that those who have uh, nothing or very little will lose even what they have. So Merton described the Matthew effect in science as more or less a regular or normal feature or outcome of competition within the academic profession. In 1993, Margaret Rosita corrected this a bit, saying that there is a thing called the Matilda effect, which is in fact a tendency for credit or recognition to systematically accrue to men rather than women in collaborations, independently of whether men were more senior or already more recognized. Who coined the Matthew effect? 
most of you, I'm assuming, will attribute or know the Matthew effect as a coinage of Robert Merton. This is how it's taught in sociology of knowledge. This is how it's taught in sociology of science. In fact, the concept of the Matthew effect was jointly developed by Robert Merton and Harriet Zuckerman, who was then his wife and is now Professor Emerita of Sociology at Columbia. This isn't very difficult to find out. The opening lines of the Matthew effect, its first printing, recognize Zuckerman's contribution quite explicitly, but do not cite it as such. Now, interestingly enough, if you go on Wikipedia, which is where these two excerpts, the big ones are from, as you can say, the last sentence in the first paragraph does mention Zuckerman's contribution, although it doesn't explicitly credit Zuckerman, it more or less says that Merton credited Zuckerman uh, as the co-author of the concept. But the second paragraph, which is where um, its use in sociology of science is elaborated, it is attributed back to Merton and Merton only. As I said, Merton was quite explicit about recognizing um, Zuckerman's contribution. But a bit later on, here's footnote credit, what we tend to think of as thanks for typing. So in the footnote of the second and third editions of the Matthew Effect, uh, Merton actually recognizes Zuckerman's contribution, stating uh, that it is now belatedly, and then repeats his own statement, still in a footnote, um, saying it is now belatedly evident to me that I drew upon the interview and other materials of the Zuckerman study to such an extent that the paper should have appeared under joint authorship, and then went on to add that a sufficient sense of distributive and commutative justice would have required one to recognize, however, belatedly that to write a scientific paper is not sufficient grounds for designating oneself as its sole author. Still, Burton is referred to as the creator of the concept of the Matthew effect in science. The number of people who know about Zuckerman, although I like to think that it's increasing, is, I would say, proportionately significantly smaller. This clearly did not, I mean, as I mentioned, Zuckerman is, um, well, at least, managed to become a professor uh, at Columbia. So in that sense, we could say that it wasn't a great impediment in her own career. But then on the other hand, we could also see her career or her success in the academia as occurring in spite of this. Another famous footnote predator is Slavoj Žižek, who um, in this, um, I think, uh, edition of the Ticklish subject um, mentions that he drew extensively on the work of his also first wife, uh, Renata Seletzel, but interestingly enough, does not engage with Seletzel's work in the main body of text. What does this mean for who gets to stay in the academia? If knowledge of certain kinds of knowers is primarily associated with personal experience, or as uh, Black Rose Lindsay and Bogosian would say, grievances or frustration or politics. So if it is not scientific enough, then it is easier to domain that knowledge as being only relevant for the field that studies that domain of experience or more generously reality. Contrast, for instance, the concept of sociology of race with the concept of sociology of class. Most people would recognize the first. Most people would think, I'm guessing, the second is a pleonasm. Of course, sociology studies class. Sociology is about class. Why do we then need to have sociology of race? 
why is sociology raise a specific subfield of sociology, but sociology of class isn't? Why is feminist theory a specific subfield of theory, but theories of class aren't? And so on and so forth. Now, if domaining means that knowledge produced by certain kinds of knowers is only relevant for that field, then it's fine to slip into non-attribution, right? It's very easy to use it in other fields or contexts. So for instance, I read a book, but then I'm discussing the topic on public radio, so I don't really need to credit it, or situations, or in other disciplines without attributing their authors. And then it's not in the end that difficult to present it as one's own. Or perhaps just not to, you know, not to say, not to speak out loudly in case someone else attributes it to us. What does this mean? What I'm arguing for here is moving towards uh, what I'm calling after Nancy Fulbright, an intersectional political economy in this context, an intersectional political economy of knowledge production. I think what we're seeing is a reflection or an outcome of the fact that much like in capitalism, um, the labor of women and minorities was treated as natural, and thus not something that needs to be valued or remunerated. It was outside of the measuring sphere of exchange. It becomes commons. It becomes something that is open to everyone. But that means it can be used by everyone and anyone without attribution. So in that sense, what we're seeing is an analogy with the way in which care and reproductive labor in capitalism has been consistently sidelined or used uh, instead of being valued, leading to its evaluation, because obviously it remains uh, essential to the reproduction of capitalism. If you think that at the end of the day, this doesn't really make that much difference. And after all, capitalism is awful for everyone. So why should we complain? I contrasted here the impact factors of sociological, a journal called Sociological Theory and the journal called Feminist Theory, both published by SAGE, uh, both peer reviewed journals. And you can see very clearly that if you publish on sociological theory, you are publishing in a journal with a relatively high impact factor for. Uh, social sciences, but if you are publishing a feminist theory, uh, probably not so good. Clearly, we shouldn't adopt nor in any, in any sort of way uncritically reproduce these kinds of metrics. But the gist of the matter is appointment committees do. Research evaluation exercises do. So these kinds of inequalities have direct bearing both on who gets to stay in the academic profession and who gets to advance in the academic profession and not least of all, how well those in the academic profession are paid. What it results in, in other words, is the fact that those who are basically not uh, white men have less convertible capital within academic job markets, but they also have less convert less of convertible capital in boundary and outside markets. So things such as writing commercial books or getting paid to do talks or um, getting other kinds of benefits uh, and access to other kinds of capital. So in that sense, it compounds intersectional privilege or lack of privilege. I am coming to the very end uh, and I wanted, I didn't want to end on too strong a note because I'm really curious in what people think and 
uh, what kind of thoughts does this provoke? What kind of thoughts has it given you? So I'm just going to state a few relatively um, short, um, and I was going to say unproblematic, but maybe a bit challenging conclusions. First of, all, first of all, the first one is that inequality is a sliding paradigm. It functions a bit like the game of whack-a-mole. So as soon as we try to plug or correct for inequalities on one end, inequalities are going to uh, slide off or show up uh, at a different end. So in that sense, focusing on, say, increasing participation of minority academics in, say, undergraduate degrees often serves, and certainly serves in certain kinds of political environments, to displace the fact that they are still, I would say, um, pretty much uh, disprivileged in other kinds of academic environments, and that these two things are also connected because obviously participation for minority academics also depends on who they get to see in higher education institutions as uh, several, several among my colleagues who work specifically on this have uh, emphasized repeatedly. Clearly measures, policies and interventions that aim at formal obstacles to equality are not a bad thing, right? So yes, they're better than nothing, but they also address only one part of the problem. And furthermore, as for instance, Sarah Ahmed among others has argued, they often serve to not address the other part of the problem. So to say, or to be, for institutions to be able to say, well, look, we are addressing this, or look, we have a growing proportion of say, uh, women in um, the leadership team. So it's fine, gender equality has been achieved. Now, individual measures or measures that tend to address individual manifestations of um, epistemic injustice. For instance, you know, trying to capture plagiarism or being diligent with citing cannot address systemic factors because systemic factors have to do with the longer history of uh, institutions of knowledge production and the reproduction of inequalities through these institutions and modes of producing. And I have a link to something that um, I would like to show you um, that I think gives a good example of how, to some degree, this can be counted through institutional practices, but I'll get uh, to the end first, just in case the sort of moving to a different screen ends up not working. Now, for me, most importantly, it is very clear that participation or equal participation is unachievable without recognition. So we need to first understand who is it that is excluded from institutions of knowledge production. But recognition itself serves absolutely no purpose unless we also have a principle of redistribution. Redistribution includes equal pay, but it also includes equal recognition or equal representation in contexts where knowledge is presented. So for instance, though not only curricula. So what I would like to say at the end, and this is coming to the implications for what decolonizing means uh, in principle and in practice in academic institutions, and I'm sure that Ali will have to say something on this, I'm hoping others will as well, is that we need to move from representational principles of decolonizing. So from trying to include, uh, to make reading lists more diverse to include more authors who are not um, white and especially not white men uh, in how we present knowledge to redistributive practices in knowledge production, knowledge production. So to assigning credit to people who have contributed to knowledge in the past. And then finally to participational, so towards a more collaborative, more just and more equal kind of knowledge production. Thanks for this. I'll stop here. If you'd like to cite this, it will be, uh, will be decent if you did. Uh, this is a paper which is um, just about to come out in current sociology, so it's been accepted currently, it's in proof proofing stage. 
Uh, but if you would like to read the preprint, that's also available and I'm very happy to share it or post it. Um, and uh, it's open access as well. So that should be helpful. Right, I'll stop sharing here. And thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jana. That was such an amazing talk and it covered so much uh, you know, in-depth in analysis of the massive problem at, at stake and at hand. Um, and it was absolutely amazing that you managed to cover so much ground in such a short period of time. We've got until two o'clock for some questions. So just as I said at the beginning, you can put your question into the chat function on Zoom or you can just raise your hand and I'll come around to you. And if you're participating via YouTube, just put it in the chat and I'll be checking that as well. Um, so typically we start with a student. So I'll start with Samina and then go on to Monica. So Samina, do you want to open the questions? Yeah, hi, I just wanted to say thank you, Jana. That was really great. And it's so amazing to hear you again. I'm going to post my question in the chat, actually, because I find that I'm more coherent in writing and I've already written my question down. So, um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you with my actual face. Thanks, Amina. <clears throat> Monica, do you want to ask your question while Samina types hers? Oh, okay. So thank you so much, Jenna, for the paper. It made me think a lot about, oh, there's a question. Why don't we wait for that question sure. to be answered? Yeah. Uh, okay, Anna. so Samina's question is, your argument seems to work on the assumption that people own ideas or knowledge. Do people really own ideas? Is there such a thing as original, i.e. completely new idea? Uh, and what does this mean for knowledge production and uh, systems and structures, institutions of higher education? Uh, to conceive of ideas as collaborative as opposed to individual. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. <laughs> I do. Several. Well, one one is one is a book length, and um, there are a couple of the uh, article lengths. Thank you so much, Samina. Um, it's a very good question, and it's one that I was hoping someone would raise. And that's always a question of do we, you know, why is, doesn't even redistribution in some ways reinforce uh, principles of um, allocation in capitalism, which is the idea, precisely the idea or the capitalism is based on, uh, and inequality as such, which is precisely the idea of uh, private ownership and individual ownership. I have a lot of political theory inflected answers to this, but I found that one that I think is fairer and much more just is at this particular point in history, we are not at the point at which I think it is possible to completely turn academic knowledge or any kind of knowledge into commons. So given that within the conceivable future of 10 to 20 years, assuming technology lasts and there is not really that much um, wide ranging civilizational collapse, we are going to see a reproduction of forms of valuation that I think underpin uh, academic knowledge production at the moment. I think it is not practical, practical to talk about uh, complete uh, open access or complete commoning of academic knowledge. I've had several discussions on this with several advocates of open access. And I mean, I've also, I've also published on this. So in that sense, I think it's a, I think it, it's a bit like the communism question, right? You know, shouldn't we just abolish all differences and wouldn't then gender and, you know, race and ethnicity disappear with it? Ideally, yes. In practice, no. In practice, we always inherit some elements of um, inequalities. And in that sense, um, I think we are, we're not in a very good position to apply that approach that doesn't at least in, or in ways that do not in, at least in the first instance, end up continually disprivileging those who are already uh, at uh, the sort of receiving, receiving end of a lot of oppression and injustice. Obviously, I do think we should be working towards commoning academic knowledge, but I do also think that that would require a different kind of 
uh, valuation. And I think that the route to that is, I think there is a route to that and it would probably consist of erasing competition, but it will also in that case need, need to raise the idea of the individual as not only the owner, but the creator of knowledge. So it would kind of need to raise or it would need to challenge epistemic um, individuality and epistemic autonomy. And both are so strongly rooted in liberal democracies that I find it difficult to imagine <laughs> that it can be done um, seamlessly or easily. But it's a it's a great it's a great question. It's a really really important topic, and that's one of the it's one of the things that I continue to work on because I think it is very interesting. Thanks, Mina, for that really great question, and thanks, Jana, for your uh, deep engagement with it. Monica, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, with a question comment. So thank you so much, Jana, for your talk. Make me think of two main things. On the one hand, your examples of Cornel West and Jennifer, I find that a bit tricky and I don't know if those are, are the best examples for that in the sense that they are, if I understood correctly, the question is that they are not, or people that could be in that position saying, I don't want to study race, I don't want to, you know, more like they're not allowed to move rather than that that's not, uh, that that's not something that for those those two cases specifically that was granted warranted you know they were studying race or they did study race at some point the fact that they decided not to or change or want to change that's when it's tricky but i think there is a bit of um, a claim there in that in those cases as if studying race is wrong right or there's a problem with it it's like, well, there's not a problem. And the same as many women have studied feminism, many people of color or black people, we don't have a, a choice yet, or some of us yet not, right? Um, well, maybe that was a very blunt statement. Like not everyone, but some of us don't. And what I find that, because we enter politicized and we enter into these processes within academia, and there's something about that, that well, maybe that's more of the first, the first position in that you mentioned. And also it made me think that the difficulty would be more if I want to stop. Like if I say to the Department of Sociology that hire me for doing the race teaching, uh, you know what, I just, I had it, thank you so much. I want to study textiles now and that, which is actually what I'm gonna do. But, um, it's going to be what's going to happen. Can I do that or can I not do that? How would that work? And how do it also how do it work for anybody? Because we create or we are in particular paths, and that those paths in academia are very oppressive. You have to kind of stay in your discipline, in your path. I mean, the other thing is about the assumption, and I know that when you talk about decolonizing, that it's not just about the names, um, the, if we add more names or if we actually start recognizing other people that end their knowledge. I feel like we also assume that if we're gonna bring women and BME people, we're gonna bring the right own kind of, the right kind of people. And, and that is not a guarantee either, you know, that we are bringing. So that the questions about who and how to bring people to discuss are very, you know, there are some white men, for example, that would be completely wanted and reasonable and absolutely great to bring on because of the knowledge they produce. So I think we should not dismiss the claim of the quality of the knowledge without, and I don't want to say this without, sounding that I don't want to acknowledge the other, the need for people of color and women to be quoted, but I don't want to quote certain women, thank you very much. And I don't want to quote certain people of color, you know, and there are, so, so I see, I just wanted to bring that other angle. And I don't know if my first point made any sense, what you think, okay. Thank you, Monica. They both do. I mean, they're both very deep points. So uh, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to do justice to both uh, to the degree to which I can briefly. Although I'd obviously like to continue studying both. 
the first point from my point of view is to some degree uh, a reflection of precisely the uh, power uh, dynamics that, that structure access to the field of you know academia knowledge production or higher education as a whole right in that sense you always enter the academia uh, you enter any situation as an embodied as a located being and that very fact of embodiment for some people and this is the kind of knowledge subject not knowledge ob objects uh, relation to some people already limits what they can do now obviously from a standpoint epistemology's perspective and from an intersect some elements of uh, intersectionality epistemological perspective this is a good thing obviously within we only have experience of power power and power inequality social structures from the position that we occupy within social structures. So this is the kind of the additive perspective. So if we just multiply these perspectives, we will have a more coherent, a more whole uh, picture. I do not necessarily, I mean, I, I agree with this. I think it's a, it's a great uh, idea in and of itself. But I think the problems occur exactly where you identify them, which is, well, if this is the case, then these positions, if knowledge is in fact additive, uh, or at least if it can be, if it's expandable in that sense, if it's plural, and if academia is non-conflictually plural, which I think it isn't, much like liberal societies aren't non-conflictually plural, on the contrary, um, then we should all be able to eventually understand uh, social structures from a multiplicity of perspectives and shift out of these perspectives of distribute academic labor uh, depending on the need of the situation or um, our own proclivities or our own situations and so on and so forth. So in principle, we as epistemic subjects should be able to study even though we may access um, epistemic institutions or conditions from uh, unequal positions, we should then be able to study anything we wish. But as you yourself have said, it doesn't seem to me like this happens or happens easily. And this is precisely the limitation that I ident identify. In an equal environment, you should be able to move on to studying you know, wine production in France much like anyone else. Interestingly enough, I mean, I, I know that Ali works on uh, black and minority ethnic middle class um, cultural identities or class identities. So I think that's a really interesting, that's, that's an interesting intersection uh, right there. But interestingly enough, this often doesn't happen. I think precisely what you're identifying as the constraints of the structure of academic institutions are often uh, one part of the story in the sense in which our own identification with the structures that underpin us at the same time prevents us. So at the same time, they're enabling and constraining as I guess I'm, I'm making a very <laughs> making a very banal sociological point, but hopefully um, attributing it to uh, something that uh, that's relevant to to that. Um, I'm trying to remember what the second uh, the second. I have a feeling that I might have in some ways. Uh, oh, okay. I think I remember what the second point was, which is uh, whether it is a was it whether it is a limitation in and of itself, or sorry, I got too excited. No, was, I, I got about, carried away answering this one. It was about citing and ah. citing other people yeah yeah, yeah or not representational and the other distributing and of course um it's a very good point i mean you know it's it's um as, as, as a white feminist i hate even being in a position in which i have to myself utter the words not all men or not all white men but yes clearly um there are uh, many things that as you yourself could have seen in this presentation i not only continue to cite but continue to engage with um, what I do think, however, is that, and I mean, this is a broader theoretical point, I think we never evaluate knowledge from a standpoint of neutrality. I don't think there's a role in bail uh, from which we uh, tend to judge um, contributions to knowledge. I don't think that contributions to knowledge are ever evaluated in uh, 
a completely, certainly not in social sciences and humanities. I mean, I, I remain agnostic as to whether that's possible in other kinds of disciplines or subjects. And that's another, uh, that's another big topic. So in that sense, I think it is always in some ways a political and pedagogical choice. So it's a question of, okay, so if we only have, you know, space for 10 texts on the syllabus, what are these texts going to be? And one of the ways in which I practice decolonizing in my own, uh, in my own modules, in my own syllabi, when I teach theory, essentially, is by saying, well, it's not like we need to add people who are not white men onto the syllabus. We need to recognize that people who are not white men have been excluded historically from the syllabus. I mean, I, I often use this, um, the Beauvoir Sartre example because it's such an obvious one, right? So, you know, why is of two people who have written on basically the same topic throughout their lives, why is one of them sort of a mainstay of continental philosophy and the other a sub-clause within feminist philosophy? Uh, so in that sense, you know, why do we, and, and they are a very good example because they're both white, they're both privileged in more ways than one. They were both famous uh, in their own time, except that one of them sort of rapidly disappeared from the canon. I think with Merton, we're seeing the same thing. So I think it's also about being mindful about politics of memory in the sense of who was there, but is no longer recognized as there. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think it's a, I don't think there's, a way to perfectly square that process, which is precisely why I think it's never a discussion that can be stopped. And it's also not a, in many ways, it's, it's a pedagogical discussion as much or perhaps even more than a moral or political one. I mean, including people on the syllabus does not solve problems of inequality. But on the other hand, if students only ever see, sorry, students I'm talking to in this group term, so sort of collective term, if they only see certain kinds of people on the syllabus, they will probably start associating certain kinds of knowledge with certain kinds of people and thus themselves become more likely to reproduce these kinds of race and gendered um, forms of valuation in which they will hear anyone uh, who is not white as talking about their own experience of racism rather than as talking about social dynamics, social power, or social structures. Uh, thanks, Monica, for those reflections. Thanks, Yana, for responding to them. We've just got over five minutes. So what I'm going to do is read out a couple of questions from YouTube and then go to Maya, and you can uh, hopefully uh, see if there are common themes and try to respond to them in, in the time that we've got left. So I'll just post it into the chat so that you can um, see it after I say the question. But the first question from YouTube is basically about um, whether you've extended your work on epistemic positioning and injustice to think about work that's co-produced, which I, I assume means kind of like, you know, co-authored co projects, co-authored uh, co-PI projects and so on. Um, a second question from YouTube was about whether you have um, considered engaging with this discussion that so much of the literature of decolonizing that comes from the Global North cites authors from the Global North, um, and whether a more effective strategy would be to turn to non-English texts and so on and authors coming from the Global South. And Maya, do you want to go to your question as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so my question relates to an article by uh, Maysun Tukedi and Stuart Tanok. It's called Subcontracting Academia. And it's about um, basically, you know, in these North-South research partnerships, you have subcontract like work which is being subcontracted to research assistants in the Global South who tend to do, you know, most of the work. And then it eventually gets appropriated by um, white academics in the Global North um, and academics who work in, in these institutions here. Um, so my question, I guess, is how, how do you see epistemic positioning being reflected on a global scale if we consider um, a global political economy of knowledge production in that sense? Well, so if you can somehow manage to uh, respond to three questions simultaneously in four minutes. I can. I think that's the biggest outstanding question in the sense in which I have applied this and other people have applied this uh, to, I mean, one, one is the article you mentioned, to precisely regional differences, 
I think a lot of that is mediated by language, uh, as one of the one of the YouTube questions suggests. Whether I think that citing non-Western um, or non-global North authors is, is one of the ways of undoing this, I absolutely do, and in fact do more of that in my writing than in this particular uh, this particular talk. But I think we all also always need to be mindful of uh, speaking to our audiences. So in that sense, um, I am not entirely unconstrained by uh, models and requirements of um, academia. So in that sense, I think it's also a question of, well, what do I want to see my own work as contributing to? And given that I've often um, seen ends or experienced ends of the processes that I'm describing myself, I know, for instance, full well that there is a challenge in trying to argue that this isn't about universities or this isn't about women or this isn't about minority academics. So in that sense, it's also related. Uh, related to that, I also, I also saw that David had a, a really good question in the um, in the chat on sources, but I can probably answer that by email. So it is, it's, it's the most recent UCA data is the segregated by subjects, so by discipline, but there is also some work to quantitatively. So there is some work to, to do there, but I recommend their study. It's really, uh, it's really good on all sorts of um, quant, quant versus qual. So whoever works there has a good, a good sense of stats. So in that sense, I would always say um, the idea, going back to the two YouTube questions <laughs> and Maya's, the idea of this kind of intervention is not necessarily to rectify epistemic injustice, because that's both a political project and clearly a longer one or more ambitious one. The idea of this kind of intervention for me as a theorist is to first of all explain why the structure of knowledge production and the distribution of access and benefits within and recognition and credit within knowledge production looks the way that it looks. And I think this concept helps us understand a bit why that's the case. And also the degree to which it is, I guess, political or perhaps oriented towards rectifying epistemic injustice is primarily through what Fricker refers to as hermeneutic injustice. So if we recognize things when they happen, as something, so for instance, as epistemic injustice or as epistemic positioning, we'll be in a better position to do something about them. So it's as simple as that. And whether we choose to do something about them or not is then, from my point of view, the domain of politics. So I, I think stating that I, you know, if we just broaden the reading lists a bit, that will help uh, rectify epistemic injustice is a bit of an sort of overstatement of how important academia is. I think we have many other things that we need to do, and not all of them are in the domain of intellectual interventions either. So, yeah. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, everyone, for asking your questions on YouTube. Thanks, Maya, for um, that thoughtful questionnaire and for giving a reference to everyone for such an important process that characterizes uh, contemporary academia. Um, Jana, thank you so much for giving up your time to come back to Cambridge, albeit virtually, to give this amazing talk. <clears throat> um, this is recorded, so it's available on the department's uh, YouTube page, Cambridge Sociology. If anyone wants to um, look back at it or to get any more of those references uh, from Jana's presentation, we're back in two weeks where we'll be joined by Professors Gaminda Bambra and John Holmwood talking about their recent book, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory which I imagine is actually going to really develop and kind of engage with some of the material that Jana presented today. So hopefully that will be um, a nice kind of collaborative process of knowledge production moving forward on this issue. Thank you so much, Jana, and thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Thank uh, you, Ali, and thanks everyone for the questions.